Mutiny is the most terrifying scenario for any general. Discipline is abandoned, the chain of command breaks, and soldiers resort to killing officers and taking spoils for themselves. Like every army before and after, the Roman army was no stranger to mutinies. Historians have recorded 76 of such instances in the Roman army, just between the years of 90 to 30 BC. But before we dive into some examples, it's important to understand the rules within their military. When citizens joined the Roman army and took their sacred military oath, they effectively forfeited a great deal of their civil rights. Their life would from now on be dictated by harsh military discipline, with their general being able to legally punish or even take their lives if need be. But despite all this, the Roman military never contemplated any sort of punishment for an officer or soldier who spoke out his mind. In fact, ordering a subordinate to stay silent and not talk to his comrades was a terrible offense. And even in the army, they still retained their right of libertas, the freedom to be treated like a citizen. Moreover, every general was expected to keep their men informed about the latest developments and remain open to their suggestions and demands. On the one hand, this allowed for a chance to resolve problems in the camp as soon as they arose. But on the other, it meant that when doubts about a general's ability or strategy started to emerge, soldiers and officers could openly question them, be it in secret or out in public. But despite this, soldiers would still usually obey their generals out of both the fear of harsh punishments for mutiny and respect to their military oaths. Other times, when soldiers kept receiving unreasonable orders with no explanations, their protests and demands could grow so bold that it would be their generals that would have to give in to demands, even if acting as though under no external influence, just to keep up the illusion of supreme authority. This constant tug of war between giving the soldiers what they want while still maintaining authority was present to some degree in every campaign. At Pharsalus, for example, Pompey was forced to give battle against his wishes, due to the barrage of criticism he received from his subordinates. Julius Caesar too experienced this at the Battle of Ilerda, when a delegation of soldiers came to inform him that they were tired of him avoiding confrontation with the enemy, and told him to hurry up, or else. But one of the most extreme examples of this was Aulus Postumius Albinus during the Siege of Pompeii during the Social War of 89 BC. The soldiers under Albinus's command were recruited in Rome, and were far from ideal, being especially unruly and unfit for military service. Albinus himself was not much better. He had a poor military record, and his aristocratic arrogance, avarice, and lack of care towards the well-being of his soldiers meant that he was at risk from the get-go. The situation turned worse when a rebel relief army was rumored to be on its way to relieve the siege of Pompeii. This made Albinus's soldiers increasingly fearful, and unrest quickly spread across the ranks. Albinus, determined to end the murmuring, called for an army assembly. This, by the way, was a common practice within the armies of Rome, and drew inspiration from the political rallies when orators would address the public from an elevated platform, and would try to win over the audience. When done correctly, this direct confrontation was a good way to diplomatically reach common grounds with the soldiers. Albinus's speech, however, managed to greatly anger the soldiers, and provoke a violent mutiny. With no weapons at hand, his soldiers started throwing stones at their defenseless general, and killed him in the subsequent riot. Now without a formal commander, Rome had a rogue legion to deal with, which posed another multifaceted dilemma. Contrary to what you might assume, Roman soldiers could display a high degree of discipline even when mutineering. Just like with modern trade unions, they would elect representatives to negotiate their terms, while the common soldiers still managed the daily routines of the camp and even attacks on the enemy. Regardless though, ancient authors still suggest acting quickly, as mutinies could swiftly spread to nearby armies who might have similar grievances and spur them into taking similar actions. On one hand, punishments for mutineers had to be severe, Firstly, to dissuade other armies from following suit, and secondly, because the very men who have felt the power and ease of breaking the chain of command and rallying their comrades to violence are very likely to do it again. 
But on the other hand, a punishment too severe might scare the mutineers into spiraling down to even more chaos and violence. So let's see how the Romans handled this situation. The task of dealing with the mutineers fell to a nearby army led by General Sulla. Contrary to tradition, Sulla sent a full pardon to the entire legion at Pompeii, on the condition that they would now loyally serve him. The overjoyed mutineers swiftly agreed, and did exactly as promised, becoming an integral part of Sulla's future victories in the social war. So in this situation, Sulla positioned himself as a friend to the soldiers, and used their hate towards Albinus to fuel their loyalty and gratitude towards him. A lenient but effective strategy. Now, a quick moment to talk about our sponsor, Babbel. One thing I must do before traveling to Quebec or France is to learn a bit of French. There's nothing like traveling to a foreign place and being able to understand and communicate with the community around you. And Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world, is perfect for this. They are my favorite language app because their lessons are designed by real language teachers and could help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks. Babbel also teaches real-world conversations with interactive features and games, which helped me learn a few phrases like Où est ce restaurant and l'addition s'il vous plaît. With just a few minutes of using their app every day, which is available on your phone or computer, you can be speaking a new language in no time. So if you ever wanted to learn a language for either travel or self-improvement, now's your chance. Click our special link in the description to get 60% off your subscription today. Even someone as legendary as Julius Caesar found himself in several mutinous situations throughout his career. In 58 BC, just before facing the Suebi chief Ariovistus in open battle, Caesar's soldiers wavered. The fear of facing Germanic tribesmen, getting their supply lines cut off, and doubts about the legality of the upcoming campaign proved too much for them. At this point, Caesar was not the legendary figure he would later become, and his relationship with his troops was still in its infancy. But unlike Albinus, Caesar was a very skilled orator, and used a two-pronged strategy to quell the unrest. First, instead of calling an assembly and facing all his soldiers together at once, he called a private council, inviting only the centurions. Then he easily won them over and had them relay all the details of the meeting to their soldiers and dispel their doubts. Secondly, Caesar appealed to the soldiers' sense of duty and competition by declaring that if no soldiers followed him, he would march alone with the 10th Legion, who he was sure would not question his orders and do their duty. This elevation of some soldiers over the rest worked like magic. After all, a mutiny is only effective when the majority of the army doesn't follow through. But Caesar's full faith in the entire 10th Legion made the other legions feel like their concerns were not unanimous, and also that they were being surpassed in bravery and loyalty by their equals. What I find most amusing about this situation is that there is no way the entire 5,000 men of the 10th Legion were as fearless and loyal as Caesar claimed them to be. It's far more likely that when Caesar praised them at the meeting, the centurions of the 10th simply did not correct him, and then passed on his praise to the entire legion, while all the other legions assumed the 10th truly stood unwavered. If Caesar chose to speak to all his soldiers at once, like Albinus did, it's very likely they would have seen each other's mutual doubt, and the situation might have escalated. But alas, that's not what Caesar did and very soon a delegation of soldiers informed him that the entire army was ready to follow him wherever he wished. Caesar's actions are a textbook example of how a general should act when faced with the threat of mutiny. Identify the problem from the officers, split up the opposition, and eliminate them individually. As you can see, Caesar used the divide and conquer strategy even for his own men. But fear and doubt are not all that could spark a mutiny. Poor conditions of service, like a lack of pay and supplies, delayed discharge, or even the chance to press their demands without facing punishment could all spur soldiers into taking action. This is the situation Scipio Africanus found himself in 206 BC, when the garrison of Sucro mutinied due to a scarcity of supplies and not being paid in four years. To escalate the situation, Scipio fell gravely ill at Carthage and everyone thought he was going to die. 
To top it all off, many of the soldiers in the garrison had served well beyond what was considered customary for the time, and were desperate to retire. Banding together like modern workers on strike, their first step was choosing a committee of 35 ringleaders to persuade the tribunes in the camp to help them reach their demands from Scipio. Unfortunately, the tribunes were having none of it, and bluntly refused to collaborate with the soldiers. This rapidly escalated the situation into an open mutiny. Discipline broke down, officers were beaten, and men started leaving the camp in search for food and supplies. Nevertheless, the Sucro garrison still remained diplomatic, and elected officers to run the camp, with an oath being taken to uphold military discipline, while the ghosted tribunes all fled for Carthago Nova. This serves as a great example of Roman mutineers behaving very orderly. To everyone's surprise, Scipio soon recovered, and sent a delegation promising that he would accept the demands of the mutineers and wanted to welcome them back into Carthago Nova. But unbeknownst to the mutineers, Scipio was planning to crush the mutiny and reassert his authority, making sure this never happened again. He first ordered the inferior garrison of Carthago Nova to depart from the city to not raise any suspicions of a planned crackdown. Once the mutineers were inside of the city, Scipio used false pretenses to identify and separate the 35 ringleaders of the mutiny. By the next morning, the mutineers realized that the garrison of Carthago Nova had them surrounded, and all their leaders were captured. Now in a position of power, Scipio had the ringleaders publicly executed in front of the army. But the punishments didn't go any further. In fact, Scipio made sure that all the soldiers' grievances were properly addressed, and they were all soon paid and demobilized. Despite the heavy criticism ancient historians like Polybius or Livy threw at the soldiers for their behavior, this mutiny was very reasonable and diplomatic, and even Scipio empathized with the soldiers' demands. After the end of the war, these soldiers would also receive large tracts of land as a reward for their long service to the Republic. Sadly, not all mutinies had such happy endings. When the 9th Hispana Legion mutinied, Julius Caesar threatened the legionaries with decimation, the harshest punishment in the army. In this punishment, the entire army would be split into groups of 10, with one man from each group being randomly chosen to be beaten to death by the other 9. But Caesar finally settled on the execution of only 12 ringleaders chosen from a group of 120. The legionaries of the 9th Hispana had been at the forefront of all of Caesar's campaigns since the very beginning, and had suffered substantial casualties in the process. By this time, most of his legionaries only wanted their long overdue honorable discharge from the army. The fairness of their demands was known to Caesar, who chose to exclude this episode from his commentaries not to stain his image as friend of the soldiers. As you have seen, Roman soldiers were far from the malleable, staunchly patriotic, and disciplined to the death men we often see portrayed in the media. Above all, they expected some basic concessions in return for fighting the enemies of Rome. A timely pay and discharge, a share in the spoils of war, the right to speak out their minds, and above all, the appearance of competence from their generals. When enough of these were not met, the famous discipline of the Roman army could come crumbling down in a heartbeat. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out our others which tackle the different dimensions of the Roman army. A special thanks from me goes to all the Patreons that make these videos possible for your enjoyment. Consider joining them and contributing to the effort. I hope to see you all in the next one.